weeks. And um, what I'm going to talk about today, you know, COVID, as Matt already uh, mentioned, has kept us all out of the field, uh, which has been uh, difficult for some of us, but it has got me getting back to my rust life cycles and, and um, sort of um, life history strategies as a way to try to explain some of the success, I view success in um, rust fungi, just in terms of species. And so what, um, I'm gonna deviate a bit from the prior talks because there's not a lot of experimental work here. So I'm just gonna delve right into the realm of mass speculation. But uh, let me take you on a ride here uh, about what I think is going on here in, in the rust life cycle and how this translates into um, success for this lineage. Now, I, I won't belabor this point because I'm sure most of you are familiar with rust fungi, but of course, um, biologically speaking, this is a really fascinating group, at least to me. There's good practical reasons for studying these, but they these this group of fungi has many characteristics, has evolved a lot of uh, sort of almost unique or unusual features that we don't really see elsewhere in the fungi. And this includes, of course, strict obligate biotropism uh, to the extent where these can't be uh, manipulated in pure culture, for example. As far as we know, um, some species do have the largest genomes in fungi. We're getting in the range of gigs here for some of these things. Um, alternation of generations is, of course, very rare in fungi where you have different sporothalli and gametothalli that are produced at different time points in the life cycle. And um, most of these species also alternate on different hosts, a term um, uh, heterosis is the term we use for that. So they'll produce the gametophallus on one host and the sporothallus on another. And then in addition to this, we have these um, four pre-programmed stages um, or leading to five different types of developmental spores that all function differently and look quite different um, from each other into this, um, into this mix. And then um, because of some of these complexities and other reasons, um, one of the difficulties with working with this group is that, um, of course, our complete life cycle data are missing for many, many species. And so trying to make broad inferences about this group when you're lacking these types of data can be somewhat prohibitive. Um, just to remind you, our rust fungi, what we term rust fungi, belong to a single order, the Puccinialis, and we're talking about 8,000 species of known described rust fungi here. And at least when I did these calculations several years ago, this may have changed a little bit uh, due to an influx of new species descriptions lately. But um, five or 10 years ago, this did comprise about 25% or a quarter of our known Basidio mycota. So it's a huge group of fungi. In fact, our second largest order after Agaricales in terms of species, and certainly the largest group of plant pathogens. And so this leads us to kind of what we, we think of as the central conundrum um, for urodenologists, which is trying to reconcile these really complex life cycles with the obvious success in terms of species of, of the group. And I'm a real fan of John Bonner, and I'm sorry, Don, to bring up Princeton here at a Harvard symposium, but Bonner did a lot of work with um, life cycles and a lot of thinking about life cycles. And um, in, in Bonner's view, you know, an organism, we can't think of organisms, usually we think of them statically you know, is, is the adult in, in plants or animals, one stage. But Bonner, you know, we need to consider the entire life cycle when we talk about um, organisms. And certainly an organism, an individual, is sort of the unfolding or the expression of a genome um, over ontology, right? It's not a single time point. And, um, if we look at life history traits or life cycles across the tree of life, there are different patterns that repeat themselves. And of course, to me, the most interesting of these is that pattern of complexity, the complex life cycles. 
And how you define a complex life cycle really depends on what group you're working with. Um, parasitologists like to think of these as um, parasites that alternate, just require alternation between different hosts. Uh, it's been broadened out a bit to encompass any organism that has some abrupt autogenic change um, uh, that encompasses morphology, physiology, and behavior somewhere during its development. But whatever definition you use, rust fungi certainly fit in this. But um, we don't have a lot of really good studies still about complex life cycles and how these may have evolved despite the fact that they are quite prevalent again throughout the tree of life or at least in eukaryotic life. Uh, most of the work is done with animal path pathogens such as those um, things in the ambicomplexa or parasitic helminths. Um, and here's a typical plasmodium life cycle here. <coughs> But even when you start talking about complex life cycles, there's grades of complexity there. And the rust fungi fit into what's usually the rarest type um, that has developed, which is something that we've referred to as the haplodiplonic cycle, where you're talking about multicellular diploid and diploid you know, for fungi, of course, but multicellular gametophalli and sporophalli. So this is actually quite rare, um, the development of this. Uh, again, um, rust fungi are the best expression of this type of life cycle. And I'm going to assume that most of you uh, remember something about your basic rust life cycle. Um, so I, I won't belabor the point here, but just again, understand that this, this is a, a template for a temperate heterocyclic macrocyclic rust. So it's expressing all five spore stages. And uh, these uh, different gametophalli and sporophalli are produced on different hosts. There's, um, at least for a temperate rust, a very seasonal component. So we see usually basidiospore production in the spring and teleospores being the overwintering propagule. And then what's interesting to me, one of the interesting things about this life cycle is um, we certainly have the production of meospores here, but we have this increase of meospore stage here. So the spermagonia, we normally think of basidiomyces, you, you undergo meiosis, you produce these four haploid gametes, and then they've got to go out and find mates. But with the rust, there's an amplification of those gametes in this spermagonial stage. And that means that basically this, this product of a meiotic event has the opportunity to mate with multiple, multiple individuals, theoretically. So um, we have this amplification here. And then the other important amplification stage is with these mitospores. So the uridiniospores themselves um, in a heteroaceous species, this is the only spore stage that is capable of reinfecting the same host from which it was produced. And so in um, epidemiology, this becomes extraordinarily important. And most of what we know about rust at the molecular level is work done to um, look at the cues and expression in uridiniospores. If uridiniospore infection, if a single uridiniospore um, cycle gets started early enough in the season, one spore can turn into millions of spores. So what's interesting here is you have amplification of any new gametic products or any new fertilization, but you also have the generation of lots, lots of um, mitotic mutation, which can lead to interesting cases here where you might have adaptation also being driven in this stage from this increase of the mitotic cycle. Okay, so that's, as I said, is your template rust cycle, life cycle, but where we've worked these things out, we know that that is not the only life cycle that's possible in the rust fungi. Um, certainly there are macrocyclic, if we sort of fat flatten this um, life cycle out, we have, as I've just shown you, the heterocyclic ones, but we do have autoecious ones, which produce all these stages on the same host. And then we have lots of variations of this. We have, for example, demicyclic rust, which skip 
this mitotic reinforcement stage. So they don't have the production of uridinous spores. We have microcyclic rust fungi, which skip both of these mitotically produced spore stages and just do something that we would think of as more of a traditional basidiomycete type of pattern where you have production of telia, which germinate to produce your basidia and basidiospores, and those mate either through spermagonia or not and complete the cycle. And then we even have a variation of the microcyclic called the endocyclic. If you look through the literature, you'll see that um, people used to call these um, cyclical through Isha, but in fact, this Isham is functioning like a telium. In, in other words, it's producing teliospores. So meiosis is occurring here. So it's really just a variation of microcyclic where, you, where the um, telia and the teliospores morphologically resemble Isha, but, but function for um, overwintering and meiosis. So to sort of, uh, in uridinology, there are all sorts of debates about the, the course of evolution of these different life cycles. You know, there's one train of thought that um, the microcyclic stage came first and then these uh, other spore stages were added. There's another train of thought where the ground plan was this heterogeneous macrocyclic cycle and that these others are derived. And so as um, y'all know, uh, when you're lacking fossil evidence and experimental approaches, the best way to sort of test these different hypotheses is to just do a evolutionary reconstruction or phylogenetic reconstruction. And this is very old work that we did just to resolve the Puccinio mycotina, the suborder to which the rest belong to. And here we were able to resolve actually the sister order to the Puccinielis. And these are a very small order of fungi, interesting little guys called the Platygloeales. And what's really nice about Platygloeales, although there's few species, there are two genera, Yocarnarsa mignola, that are parasites, obligate parasites more or less, are very, very difficult to grow in culture of ferns. And these have more or less a typical, in um, comparison to a rust fungus, a microcyclic type of life cycle, but a typical basidiomycete life cycle where they produce basidiospores, uh, they undergo mating, and then they produce a fertile layer in these little fruiting bodies here of these probasidia that look very much like a teliospore. And these probasidia actually function like a teliospore. So, um, under the right cues, these will undergo meiosis, germinate to produce basidia and start the life cycle all over again. So certainly the sister group were capable of parasitism, formed these probasidia and had something analogous to a microcyclic life cycle. But the next step would be, of course, to see what's actually going on down at the base of the, the rust fungi. And so this is, again, very early attempt to resolve the rust tree of life um, using exemplars from all across the tree of life. And this area up here in blue is largely unresolved, but we did manage to achieve some decent resolution down here at the base. And the first thing you'll notice down here at the base is this really interesting fungus, Roger Petersonia torea which appears to be our earliest extant rust, at least the earliest extant rust that we know of. And this thing is only found on a very relictual host that's confined, confined to a couple of populations in the Pacific Northwest right now, was probably much more broadly distributed in the past. And as far as we know, Roger Peterson, Sonia uh, Toria only produces the gamete thallus never found a sporothallic state for this one. We look at the next group here, um, which includes things like our coffee rust pathogen, Hemelia vastatrix. And this entire group shaded in yellow here, this is a group of fungi for which we only know the opposite. We only know the sporothallus. We have no idea what the gametothallus is or if it exists. These do occasionally form basidiospores under the right environmental conditions, and those basidiospores do not reinfect the host 
um, that produce them. So we're not looking at something audacious. We're looking at something that's persisting as far as we know in this uh, sporothallic state. And then the sister group to those hemelias is this uh, family Micronegariaceae. It's not a very speciose family, but the important thing here is that several of these species are known to have complete heterocyclic macrocyclic life cycles with an alternation of hosts. And these alternate, um, in fact, one of these collections Matt sent to me from uh, Chile, but they alternate on Nothophagus and Podocarp. So they seem confined primarily to the summer, Southern Hemisphere. So if we put this pattern, including our outgroups all together, what we're inferring from these data is that the ancestor to the rust really most likely was host alternating and it was likely heteroecious. So it produced separate gametophalli and sporothalli and those were probably produced on different hosts. And we may be looking at here at extinction of alternate hosts in some of these lineages to explain why we've never been able to find the um, other thallus type. Uh, obligate biotrophy was probably also a feature of these. It certainly seems to be a feature of Roger Petersonia. So this brings us back to the central paradox. If that is the basal plan, if that's the life history strategy, how do we explain this tremendous diversity in terms of species? Um, if you define success for lineages as speciation, then this is a very successful lineage. And again, most of the thinking about these complex life cycles has been done with the animal parasites, but they've not been able to effectively resolve this question. There's an inherent bias, uh, almost an axiom in parasitology that parasites are sort of an endpoint in evolution. It's a secondary strategy and it, 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 it's not a successful strategy and yet we see the, re, the opposite here. Now in parasitology, um, they've tried to explain success of um, complex life cycles in terms usually of equating uh, mass or growth rate with success. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense with fungi, it certainly doesn't make much sense with, um, with rust fungi. Um, to make these kinds of equations, because obviously if you're going to grow to a size where you consume your host before it can reproduce, then, then you're not going to be successful at speciating. And the other idea that's often invoked is this idea of upward incorporation. So it's a jump in trophic levels. Um, the idea here being if you're a parasite of a host that is preyed on by a predator, then it makes sense for you to jump a trophic level into the predator so that you in turn aren't preyed upon. So this is sort of a type of host jumping, whereas this would be maximizing fitness um, to your host. So a sort of co-evolutionary invocation there. And then indeed in um, plant pathology, this is the way that we tend to think about pathogen, plant pathogen evolution, either as being a function of host jumps or host switching shown here in green, or as a function of coevolution with your host, such as the, the uh, red queen hypothesis, et cetera. So in your denology, of course, we have batted both of these ideas around multiple, multiple times and reached no successful conclusion about which process really explains evolution in the rust. And so, um, this is where I turned to my postdoc at the time, Andy Wilson, and got him to do some reconciliation analyses for, um, to test both of these hypotheses, coevolution and host jumping uh, within a Rust framework. And we did something a little bit different here. We selected, um, we wanted to select from across the Rust tree of life but also select primarily known heteroecious um, macrocyclic fungi so that we could dissect out the both hosts. So the gametophallus stage from the sporothallus stage. Um, and of course we made um, our phylogenies for the rust 
for the sporothallus host and for the gametothallus host, and then tried to reconcile these individually. And there's a lot of really interesting things going on here with this work, but the, the one thing that I want to draw your attention to is that there is a very, very strong signal of co-diversification when we reconcile the gametophallus host with the rest phylogeny. But when we try to reconcile the sporothallus host, we just don't see a strong signal at all of co-diversification there. And so the model we came up with, what we think is happening here, is that actually both of these selective pressures are in play, these forces are in play, but they're on play at different parts of the life cycle. So we have um, biological speciation, which we can see in the, these co-diversification or specialization, excuse me, um, acting on the gametothallus. And we have biogenic radiation or series of host jumps actually acting on the sporothallus. And it makes sense biologically because we know that this critical stage of fertilization, this has a very temporal and spatial component in rust biology. And so this has to have some reflection in host specificity here to um, have successful fertilizations. Any mutations that would allow a broader use of host here would have to be compensate, compensated for at the same time and place in another compatible individual. Whereas, of course, we have this induction of the mitotic um, spore, massive sporulating incre increase stage here that allows um, immediate mutations that allow a jump to another host to, to become reinforced and reflect later in the, in the life cycle. So um, being mindful of time here, um, this is sort of our, our game plan. So how do you get these other derived life cycles? Because we've seen that's not the only plan or strategy in the rust fungi. We have these other uh, life history strategies that have evolved. And um, to look at this, we go back to Tranchel, who was a great iridinologist at the turn of the last century, who thought about a lot about life cycles in rust. And Trangel had made an observation, uh, what he called correlated species. And that is that in several instances, he could find cases where two different rust species infected the same host. But when they did this, one of those species was utilizing that host just for the spore sporothallus. And um, the gametothallus would be produced on a different host, whereas the other host was microcyclic, reduced, microcyclic or endocyclic in form, and just went through this reduced life cycle on that what would be considered the sporothallus host for, for the correlated hetero species. And so to test whether we could actually see at a granular level whether this type of correlated species patterns could be found in the rusts, um, this, um, this is just a visual representation of what we were looking at. We actually chose the genus Trangelia, aptly enough. And here's ex an example of one of Trangel's correlated species where you have Pruni spinosa, which is host alternating on a ranunculaceae, and then Trangelia fusca, which is actually using the same host, but to produce um, teleospores. And this is work uh, I did with Marcus Scholler, where we actually found, of course, multiple instances of these correlated species pairs within this one genus, Trangelia. And in fact, we find other instances of this throughout um, the rust tree. So the model Marcus and I proposed then was sort of, we have these normal forces, actually not so normal, but we have coevolution and some species jumps occurring in time along this axis uh, for speciation. But we also show that this is also the starting point for other types of speciation in this direction. Uh, for instance, forming the microcyclic species. And we hypothesize that you might be able to find some evidence if this model was true, then you would expect to see also some cases where this split had occurred and these um, original sporothallus hosts 
was the only host that these things would be completing their life cycle on. And um, in order to test that hypothesis, we really needed a much better resolved tree of life. And this is something that was just completed this year after about 15 years of trying to, um, to select good exemplars from across the rest tree of life. Um, these analyses were done by former postdoc Alistair McTaggart. But basically, um, we were able to, with some um, uh, confidence, resolve this tree of life, at least in the deeper nodes for the rust fungi, looking across all rust. And we made a deliberate attempt in this analysis to both include um, uh, type species for different genera just to resolve a lot of, of, of uh, nomenclatural problems, but also to include a variety of different life cycle types within this tree. And um, to see if we can see any evidence for that opposite for, for speciation on the Sporothallus host, I want to dive in right here to this lineage, the Ravenellianii. So this is one of our suborders. It's been a little bit tricky to resolve, uh, especially the Ravenelliaceae um, for reasons uh, that I don't have time to get into. But what's interesting about the Ravenelliaceae, we've resolved four families here. And the two earliest diverging families are heteromacro. So there are typical, and we've already seen that with transgelia, where we've got species in here that are host alternating and macrocyclic. But then we have this revised family for Copsaraceae. And we'll, if we look at the actual species now that we can confidently assign to the for Copsaraceae, all of these are only known from Uridinia, uh, Uridinia and Telia. Occasionally produce basidiospores under the right conditions. Those basidiospores do not reinfect the original host. And then we get into the Ravenelliaceae. And what's interesting here is these are all, at least the species we know full life cycles for, are actually audacious and macrocyclic. So they produce all five spore stages on the same host. So what do I think is happening here? Again, looking back at a transgelia-like model where we have this temperate macrocyclic rust and a rupture that separates, uh, whether it's extinction or some sort of um, uh, of ecological disruption, but it separates the sporothallus host and the, game uh, the gametothallus host from the sporothallus host. And so what happens to these lineages through time? Well, we've seen with transgelia, of course, we can have the evolution of microcyclic or endocyclic species. But now we think we see evidence in the Ravenellianii of this also occurring here, where we do have evolution of species from the sporosalis stage, such as we've just seen in Phacopsoraceae. And that, given enough evolutionary time, what we think of is these non-functional basidiospores can eventually become adapted to reinfect this original host. And once that hump is overcome, we see immediate proliferation, recapitulation of these other spore states. And this can best be visualized if we just look at the data for Ravenelia, which has been extraordinarily difficult to, um, to resolve. And this is a split tree view. And if you look at this thing, you see that there is no simple bifurcating pattern of evolution here. This is a massive rev uh, radiation of this particular Ravenelia lineage. And we think um, or at least hypothesize that it's, it's finally through time the ability of these spore stages to be recovered that drove this particular radiation. Now the big question now is do we see the same thing here? Do we see any evidence of radiation or continued speciation from these microcyclic forms? And um, in short, um, the microcyclic Endocyclic rusts are basically scattered a couple endpoints here and lots and lots of them here in the crown radiation of rust, but we don't see evolution of lineages of microcyclic endocyclic rust. And this brings us back to this uridinospore stage and 
the importance of this stage in driving a lot of this evolution um, in this particular group. So the model now, um, we believe, I believe that we've, we've seen this happening um, again in modern pairs. This, we do see some evolution uh, or some uh, evidence for this type of pathway happening as well, deeper in the rust tree of life. So we have uh, um, radiations occurring in different directions. And then of course, we also have the radiations from the host jumps just from any individual here. And so where do we go from here? How do we test these ideas a little bit further? I'm out of time, but I will say this is um, looking with Sebastian Duplessis. Uh, genomes is obviously the next place we can go again with absence of, uh, of uh, good fossil record data or experimental methods to test this. And when we, there's very few genomic uh, data for rust fungi, and it's mostly confined to the, the crown of the rusts and even less transcriptomic data. But certainly we see evidence that there are common effectors um, when we look, parse out all the transcriptomic data from different rust. Um, effectors are the, are the thing that most people um, concentrate on. There's thousands of effectors in rust genomes, but when we look at the actual expression of them for the few species that we actually have expression data for different parts of the life cycle, of course the expression patterns are different, and there are certain families of effectors expressed here on the sporothallus host and different families expressed here on the gametothallus host, and so we, we're beginning to get a picture where we have this massive genomic toolkit, but there are, is specialization even in the effector trans, um, effector expression patterns of which of these are utilized at different points in the uh, life cycle. So um, lots of uh, funding through the years to help support these, these studies. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the members of my lab even though the vast majority of these don't um, work on rust, they've still been instrumental in, in helping my, my thinking and keeping me on the to my toes through the years. And so I will end there. Thank you for your attention.